in the year 2525, Zager and Evans here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Sharif abdel -Kadus. Sharif? Well, the Yes Men aren't the only group accused of pulling off a hoax in the debate over climate change legislation. In August, the American Petroleum Institute, the oil industry's top lobbying group, was found to have asked member oil companies to help recruit employees, retirees and contractors for anti-climate bill rallies around the country. Critics said the API was trying to fake a grassroots movement to give a false impression of widespread public opposition to, to tackling global warming. While well, as the S-Men pulled off their hoax Monday, the American Petroleum Institute held its annual meeting in Austin, Texas. Chief executives from oil giants ExxonMobil, BP America, ConocoPhillips and Chevron were all in attendance. The executives declined to speak to reporters, but American Petroleum Institute officials renewed their opposition to climate change legislation. API CEO Jack Gerard said the industry has, quote, a lot of education to do in convincing Americans to oppose mandatory emissions cuts. Our next guest has just published a new book on corporate efforts to mislead the public on human-driven climate change. It's called Climate Cover-Up, the Crusade to Deny Global Warming. Jim Hogan is president of the award-winning PR firm Hogan & Associates. He's also chair of the Canada-based David Suzuki Foundation and the Canadian chapter of Al Gore's The Climate Project. As you listen to what the Yes Men just did, deposing as Chamber of Commerce spokespeople, and the Chamber of Commerce saying they like law enforcement to look into uh, this, um, these imposters. Um, what are your thoughts about the corporate control of information and this whole issue of uh, at least throwing some question into whether climate change is a real problem? You know, one of the things I would say is that the PR stunt wasn't pulled off by the yes men. The PR stunt is basically being pulled off by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and it's been going on for decades. Um, our book, I'm a PR guy of about 30 years, and I kind of stumbled across this campaign of what I would call a kind of confusion campaign uh, when I was doing some reading, and we've documented this uh, two-decade-long campaign by industry in Canada and the United States uh, that's the energy industry, basically designed to confuse the public about climate change and give people the, the sense that there's a, a debate about the science uh, of climate change. And my, my reason for writing this book is that I don't think that PR people and industry front groups should be determining what our policies are in Canada and the United States on solving climate change. So outline the strategy. What was the corporate strategy to do this and name names? Well, the first thing was to spend hundreds of millions of dollars uh, on everything from focus groups to very sophisticated messaging to setting up groups of uh, uh, pseudoscientists to confuse the public about, uh, to create the impression that there was actually a debate where there was none. Uh, in the two decades ago, there was uh, a group called the Advancement of Sound Science Coalition that was put together by Philip Morris. They were having problems, as we know, with public credibility. So they decided to invite some friends to join this fight, what became a fight against scientists. And one of the first uh, companies they invited was ExxonMobil. And this was kind of the beginning of these uh, front groups and this war on science that has evolved and continues today um, uh, with uh, front groups all over the United States. And how did these lobbying groups or PR firms be so successful? Where was the media in all of this? Good question. I don't know. That's probably a, a better question for you than me. I, 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 I think basically uh, overworked and uh, undereducated on science and easy to manipulate. And when you have a lot of money like these people do, a lot more money than climate scientists have, they are out there all the time writing news releases, doing press conferences, creating, uh, you know, uh, phony studies and all these vehicles to basically manipulate people's thinking on, on climate science. And you, you also write about the, the level of sophistication that these PR firms have, that they, they put stories in local regional papers, avoiding larger city newspapers where journalists may have a science reporter that is more focused and may be able to pick apart the argument better. Talk about some of the strategies that TASC used that you write about. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that they did was they basically started to create this impression that there was a scientific debate. The, there was an enormous amount of research done in 
in this area to uh, you know they do these focus groups and they find out that your average person thinks that there's always a, d a debate in science so rather than kind of fighting and saying climate change isn't happening let's just say we don't know if it's happening there's there's a debate now that debate actually wasn't taking place in the scientific community it was actually taking place in uh, um, in the news media, in the mainstream news media. And just by repeating it, having enough money to repeat these kinds of messages over and over again, people start to become susceptible to this. The, the root of all this, this campaign, is the fact that uh, corporations have less and less credibility as the years roll along, particularly over the past couple of decades. But more and more money. Uh, more and more money and more and more interests to protect, but less and less credibility. So what they do is they actually hire fake groups of scientists, put together these what we call astroturf groups, to go out there and uh, act and say things that these corporations couldn't say themselves. Jim Hogan, um, we read in headlines today that in West Virginia, activists opposed to mountaintop removal staged a sit-in in in the governor's office. Seven people were arrested. Uh, you write about little coal salvaging a future that's stuck in the tar sands. Uh, people in the United States don't know as much about the tar sands uh, in Canada that they should, since a lot of our energy is coming from there. And you also talk about how the debate cripples public policy and paralyzes private action. Go from little coal to that. Well. It, it let me give you an example. About a year ago, I was kind of shocked to find, reading a paper in Canada, that the premier of Alberta, where the tar sands are, uh, decided that they were going to spend $25 million on a public relations campaign on the tar sands. And I was shocked because, well, the, this is the political leader of, of uh, the wealthiest province in Canada, thinking that the tar sands uh, was a public relations problem, not an environmental problem. And I think that's where the problems start, but they get worse because of the, the massive amount of money. $25 million is an enormous amount of money. It just overwhelms the system. So you just, you, you're able to hire the best researchers, you're able to come up with the best messages, you're able to hire the best PR firms, you can send out the most, new, most news releases, you can hire the best scientists for hire, and it's just impossible for legitimate climate scientists to have a voice in these kinds of situations. And we just have a minute left, but you write about how reading the book may affect your, your faith in humanity. What gives you hope about the whole climate so-called so debate and, and future changes to legislation. The more we know about these kinds of groups and these kinds of efforts, the less they work. And it, I would just encourage journalists to ask these people whether or not they're actually uh, practicing climate science, whether they have, they are climate scientists, and who they're taking money from. Start to ask these questions and shed light on these people, they'll be far less effective. We want to thank you, Jim Hogan, for being with us. The book is called Climate Cover-Up, The Crusade to Deny Global Warming. And that does it for today's program. If you'd like to read a transcript of today's show or if you missed any part of it and want the video or audio podcast or want to embed it in your website, you are welcome to. Go to democracynow.org where you can also follow us on Twitter. Uh, Democracy Now! is produced by Mike Burke, Sharifa Dokadus, Aaron Mate, Anjali Comet, Steve Martinez, Nicole Salazar, Hani Massoud, Robbie Karen, Mike DeFilippo, Miguel Nagara, and Peter Curries are our engineers. Democracy Now! broadcasts on more than 800 stations, on Pacifica stations, on NPR stations, on public access TV stations, and PBS stations. We're on community and college radio stations around Canada. We've just um, gone on television daily in Austria, and I'm looking forward to address the Elevate Festival in Austria tomorrow. Um, Democracy Now! is your program on television, on radio, on the internet. Your radio station, your public television station deserves support, needs your support. You are the protector of public media in this country, which is why we can bring you the kinds of uh, broadcasts that we do regularly, exposing the corporate control of information, of the media, today bringing you stories from the Yes Men to the young man, Sam Pollan, who was arrested outside Blue Cross Blue Shield. And hear why people are protesting in their own words. Also, special thanks to Becca Staley, Nick Gilla, Hugh Grant, Samantha Chambly, Jessel Noor, John Gerberg, John Randolph, Kellen Innocent, Kieran Krug Meadows, Rakam Penny, Vesta Goddars, Rabia Algani. Want to also thank Brandon Jordan for the footage today. 
and thank you also to Kai Newkirk uh, for helping uh, with our access to our guests today. Again, our website is democracynow.org. You can also get our headlines in Spanish for any radio station to take, as more than 200 are, and read those headlines in Spanish and in English. And if you're a teacher, write to us at stories at democracynow.org and tell us how you're using Democracy Now! in your classroom. I'm Amy Goodman with Sharif Abdel-Kadus. Thanks so much for joining us.